Hello, this is Dr. Martin Bucher, and I'm going to show you some amazing old stuff on the pioneers of rhino conservation in Namibia. I dug around in my archives and I discovered stuff that we did in 1993 when rhino conservation in Namibia was just right. We were all young and full of energy. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we were doing it nevertheless. So here we go, and let's go and focus on the place. It was Ochevasandu and Karos, northern Namibia. It's basically west of Atosha. And the following 30 minutes will give you a rundown of what happened that day with the men and women involved in this interesting After stuff. Do they put a game capturing today? You're going to dehorn? You're going to again put them pregnant? You're going to make some rhinos? Can you just get a view? How the surroundings stunken? This is in Barton, it's quite famous for the books they wrote about animals in South Africa. This is what the crew exists about. Bartlett again. Bob sitting there in the car doing some saddle work. Some American reporter. And there we got Adi with the chopper. Just preparing to take off. Here we are. The first rhino has been caught and darted and it's down sleeping and here we are trying to take dental impressions. This was the first time that that was done in the world. Um, a friend of mine, Dr. Pete Morkel, and I had gone and looked at aging rhino and it was a tricky story because when a live animal was there you couldn't really look at the teeth and there were obviously no records. So we developed a method to take dental impressions in the felt while the animal was sleeping and then developed it from there. So here we are. We had some special gags opening the jaw. The head was normally on a box and here I am cleaning the debris, the residue plant material of the teeth. Then we had special little molds, those little blue trays that were filled with alginate impression like you would normally have at a dentist. And with that, we were then attempting at that stage to take impressions. As I say, it had never been done before, so it was, it was really exciting stuff. You will notice the cold water bottle because it was hot and when you put warm water in alginate it sets incredibly fast and it actually catches you. So we had ice water that we mixed with normal water to try and extend the time that we could work it with. So on the one hand we tried to do fast work because the animal wasn't supposed to lie there for a long time, it was hot see as we go along that the help is for cooling the animal down with water while the veterinary guys were doing their work drawing blood measuring the horns and eventually removing dehorning some of the rhino to prevent try and prevent poaching this was initial days of dehorning um, it's become a common practice in many areas of the world and here i am inserting the first impression it's quite a scary story as a dentist to stick your fingers in there because these teeth are incredibly strong and the animal is sleeping but it's not out completely so every now and then you will hear it breathing and sniffing and while you have your hands in the mouth like that you will also feel the crunching on that thick log of wood so one has to be careful The 
time to wait is used by other people. In this case, we can see they're measuring the length of the horn. They're marking the horn. They do that, and this was Mr. Louis Geldenhuis, to make sure that they don't cut into the living tissue. They take, I think, about five centimeters from the base of the horn because it's like a fingernail. If you cut it too short, you actually cut into the live tissue. So here we have our first impression. Um, you can see the plant debris still, um, and then we always try to do another one. The second one normally came out cleaner because obviously some of that plant had been removed there. Trying in the second tray, you can see it's all going a bit faster. Um, a lot of enthusiastic people, amazing camaraderie. Uh, helicopter pilots, veterinary surgeons, helpers, and then of course many people taking video material um, and interested parties all involved in rhino conservation in the early 1990s. Here we're mixing the second lot. Imagine this is about the same volume as you would use for about 30 normal dental impressions for, for humans. Okay, in goes the second impression, and we've realized that the rug has slipped a bit. So here I am opening the jaw a little more and repositioning the big log or the big wooden wooden wedge. In goes the second impression and you just have to sit and wait. It takes about two to three minutes to set. If one removes it too early it actually tears. If you wait too long it sits it's tricky to get out. So it was a lot of learning um, that happened at that stage. You can see the veterinary surgeon continuously taking the temperature of the animal. And here we are, Mr. Louis Geldner is starting to dehorn the rhino. He made a mark with a cokey pen and he's cutting along that line. When animals are sedated as they are here, we, <clears throat> the veterinary surgeons put a cloth over their eyes to calm them down. It helps a big amount. Um, if they can't see what's happening, they can still hear. In some cases, we even try to close their ears just to keep them calm and restful. Here we are cleaning out the debris because we will now cast plaster into this to get a copy of the teeth in the mouth. And from that, we could age the animals. When we started this, we used data that came from East Africa, from Dr. Peter Hitchens, who had done a lot of work on animal skulls. So he had a sort of a rough estimate of when teeth looked like ABC, the animal would have been 15 or 20 years or whatever. So we started working with those scales and then we compared them to animals that the conservationists knew how old they were and we actually developed a new scale for dental aging. Initially it was only done for black rhino, as in this case. Um, it was later extended for white rhinoceros as well. Their teeth looked very different. Black rhino eat shrub, thorns and little branches. And black rhino eat grass, I mean, white rhino with a wide lip eat grass. So their teeth look a lot like a pig's teeth, except they're much, much bigger. Here we've got the dental impression. And it's exciting because now we're re removing the tray and then we're going to cut up the alginate, which is like a rubber substance and remove it from the plaster and out comes a copy of the dentition of the rhinoceros. <laughs> the 
This technique was later taught to the people at Nature Conservation, as they were called in those days in Natasha, and also to veterinarians in South Africa. I'm not sure if they still use it. Um, anyway, at one stage it was done routinely when rhino were captured and relocated, just to keep tabs on how old they were and to improve the aging methods. Tim, hast du das auch richtig? Here's my son Tim. He was five years old at that stage. Imagine growing up in Africa and being able to do that with your dad. This is our lunchtime. At lunchtime it was too hot, so there was no capturing, and then everybody sat in the shade and just had a good afternoon rest. This is in the afternoon, you can see near about an hour before sunset, the teams went out again and then we caught more rhino. So I think in the first day we did about three or four. Once again inspecting the mouth, every animal is a bit different. Most of those at that stage were young bulls and it was important to try and see how old they were. What the conservationists also do, they mark the feet, take a chainsaw and clip the nail, so to say, and that makes it easy for trackers to see which animal they are following. In other words, when a tracker, uh, a tracker follows that specific animal, he will see that on the back foot there are two notches, or on the right back foot there are two notches, and in this way they can identify which animal has been walking along there. Here is a dart that was shot from the helicopter in the, um, the dart gun. And the veterinarians removes it. They normally inject some antibiotic into the wound to prevent any infection. Here we are sitting on the other end doing our dental work, impressions, and then Mr. Louis Geldner is ready to also start de honing. You will notice that the animal has been kept wet just to cool it down because animals, when they can't breathe easily and when they stress like this, and if it's warm, they can overheat very quickly, um, which is a life which can be a life threatening situation. Here we are with our big toothbrush. A modified scrubbing brush with a handle on, especially for rhino teeth. <laughs> Inserting the wooden wedge and then testing our trays again. Mixing again. You can see clearly we're getting the knack of it. It's getting, going faster. It looks more professional and every know, everybody knows what to do. Remember this was in 1993. There were no cell phones, there was no internet really. Um, these videos, they're a bit wild and woolly as you can see. I had a friend of mine who was standing there with a camcorder and he was also trying to do some comments. Clearly not a professional setup, but it was fun and games and amazing times. I think all of us that have been there can remember the good times that we had while doing good in trying to save these animals from certain extinction. Timmy? Timmy? Timmy, weg da bitte. Okay, so the dental impressions have been done. 
Um, the dehorning is starting. Um, I think these were some of the first dehornings that they did. This is in Western Natasha, and poaching had been rampant before. And the Indian government decided to have a concerted effort to try and save these rhino. They were relocated to a special area that nobody else had access to, and it was amazing because in very in a short period of time, you could say 10 years, black rhino basically doubled. They they came to a population at that stage when Namibia eventually had the highest black rhino population in the world. So it is really a matter of having management in place, having the right people at the right positions, and animals can be saved if you get that order. The press, all present, those, that's the pilot, Mr. Ati Hoffman. And here we are, putting the rhino upright so that Louis can finally round off the, the stump of the horn. It's actually a sad sight to see such a majestic animal being, um, you know, you could say stumped of its horn. Um, because because of human behavior. But that's the reality of it. That's the reality of conservation. You have the forces that kill animals for short-term gain for whatever reason. And then on the other hand, you've got the forces to try and keep these very special animals on our, on our planet as long as, they, as we can. Okay, everything's been done. The animal has been has received the antidote. He's still a bit groggy. I'm sure he doesn't know what's happened to him. He gets up and he trots off into the bush. There's our chopper again. Onto the next rhino, and you will see these videos were taken from a moving truck. When the rhino is down, the chopper circles. And then the veterinary surgeon and the staff to help have to rush to get to that place because you don't want to leave the rhino down in the heat. You have to get to it as quickly as possible, get it in the right position, start measuring temperature and cooling the animal down. You can see here on the left the veterinarian, Dr. Conrad. Conrad Brain. Uh, everyone calls him Nad. He's a well known figure in the Mibian um, veterinary, wildlife veterinary circles. Nad, what do you got here, Bull? His buddy. Here's my dental kit with a gag, with a wooden wedge, and then, of course, the uh, alternate impressions. So here we are, on to number four. You can see it's a young bull. Rhino have got their baby teeth, or some of their baby teeth, up to about 8 to 10 years. And it's like in a human, you could say in humans, at 12 years we lose our last baby teeth. This is my friend, Duncan Geltrist. You will see Duncan was like my right hand man. And he, everybody was helping. Trying to get this. another nail job. In other words, the nails were clipped to give the trackers an indication of which animals they were going to follow in the future. Here you can see the little marks on the nails. The foot underneath is actually quite. Well, it's like hard leather, but it's not like horn, it's, it's soft, so it'll, it'll walk softly on the ground. That's Mr. Pierre de Pree, Mr. Louis Geldenhuis, and then some teams with their cameras and microphones.
Here we've got an assistant. They have been taking blood samples from the animals. Today, all that would, be, that would have been done with DNA. As in those days, there was no DNA analysis, but I'm sure if these blood samples have been kept, we could still do DNA analysis today. As you see, many of these people there have got these little epaulets. Um, meaning that they were employed by nature conservation. I think virtually all of them have left. The only one that's still there today uh, in 2021 is Mr. Pierre Dupree. Here the ear is, is notched. In other words, a notch chopped out of the ear. So if you have the rhino on game capture and um, cameras, you can see by the ear markings which rhino it is. Here I am, in this case, the impression didn't work out. We, yeah, we had too much alginate, so I'm cutting away the excess alginate before I try and dislodge this thing, because it's quite, there's very, very little space, and these lips are really solid. Right, out comes the impression. Here we are with the saw again. Dehorning another rhino. Right. You can see all the nice little horn chips. I'm sure the guys that believe in the aphrodisiac effect of rhino horn, they will be happy to have those. Chips. So here is the horn. These horns are then marked and kept by Nature Conservation in a special room, uh, supposedly to be auctioned someday, depending on the legislation of the country. That Myself. As a young dentist, Matt, he worked for Nature Conservation. Louis Heldman has worked for Nature Conservation. Here yeah, they are marking the horns. Every rhino gets a special registration number and he says that it's a male. Male number 53, and <clears throat> for the first time then, male number 53 had a dental record, which, is, which was a useful, very, very useful thing. On the right, Mr. Pierre Dupre, who in 2021 is Chief Warden of Etosha National Park. Where we stopped yesterday, we're going to this go is the next today, morning, another capture day. It's still early morning here in Ochevasando. We had our camp place Karos. The helicopters. We had a bit of rain this morning. Just to give you an impression of how the campsite at Karos looks like. There's our hut, kitchen, everything, bath, shower. There's the game capture truck, the lovely surrounding, good posture. What a safe heaven to be in. Here's everybody making me ready for another exciting day of rhino capturing, dehorning, tooth impressions, few surprises in the stock.
there's our taxi. The jolly crew is still carrying around a bit of coffee. The game capture truck. Here comes the mechanic also now. Here comes the mechanic. Six clouds hanging on the sky. A few little raindrops falling. Isn't that beautiful pasture? See what the helicopter, there the rotors are going. Okay, the first rhino for the day, the same procedure, dental impressions, marking the ears, taking blood samples, measuring, <coughs> measuring the horn, chipping the feet, and then of course dehorning in the end, just before the animal is woken up and released again. To develop all these little gadgets, um, Dr. Pete Morkel and I used some old skulls, so I could get I could get some measurements as to tooth size and length, and try and anticipate. And work out shapes that could work in live animals. Um, it took about two months, and this was the first test run in the, in the bush in the felt, and it actually worked out pretty well. You could see the impression in place, sort of setting, and you can see the helpers have all learned what to do. It goes much faster, it looks easier, and you can also see there's less stress. So here I'm trying to wiggle the impression out. It comes out, it looks much, much better. You can see I've managed to clean off more material. So the whole thing is going smoother and smoother. You can see here the little black or blue spot on the bum of the rhino. That's where the dart had been. Um, disinfection material and antibiotics to prevent infection. Another impression, loading the tray, and here Duncan is, I'm teaching Duncan how to do it, so that hopefully he could carry on with it. Here's Mr. Louis Geldenhuis, here on the front our veterinary surgeon, our vet, Nad Brain. Then many helpers around it. Today one would have 
cell phones to record all this much much better pictures high high resolution and so on but these were early days and yeah it was just it was amazing it was amazing times yeah you cast plaster into the impression let it sit for 15 minutes and then you can remove the impression material and you have a cast of the dental situation in the rhino. You can see once the plaster has been inserted, I actually knock the tray onto the solid surface. That's to get all the bubbles out and to get the plaster of Paris to fill all the little nooks and crannies that are in the impression. And in the end, you put a big dollop on top of that and you turn it upside down and you have it set. You normally try and put it down on a smooth surface, either plastic or canvas sheeting so that one can dislodge it easily. In this case, it's just a flat surface. I think it's on a plastic, plastic lid of a bucket. Some tin foil here. Say goodbye. Many thanks. Tschüss. Viel Spaß noch. Schöne Zeit noch. Tschüss. Auf Wiedersehen. Tschüss. Und alles Gute, ne? Weiter. Ja. Viel Spaß. Bei der Arbeit. Aber ein bisschen im Ziel. Right, here we are. That was the end of the story. Um, thank you, everyone, for the good times. Thanks for all my friends. And thank you for watching this.